Hello, I am Alan Girding, and this is Designer Diary. Today, we're going to talk about what makes a good roleplay session. What do I mean by a session? I mean every time you gather your friends around the tabletop RPG table, whether it be virtual or in person, and how do you make sure that everybody has the best time possible? Good time. Because, let us be very clear, you don't want a bad session. You want your friends to come back to the table to play again and again and again. You don't want to be one of those lonely dungeon masters where no one will come over because in the rare chance that they did come over, you ruined it, you spoiled it, you blew it. Blew it. No. I wish I could go back in time and give myself a type of checklist, checklist. Something I could have followed to make sure that everybody was getting the most out of our time together. And that is today's episode of Designer Diary. And to understand that, we should look at a previous episode. When we talked about the six different player vowels, these different player types, because you need to understand why people are coming to your table in order to satisfy their needs. So it doesn't matter if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or Mothership, and I hope you are, Bye, Mothership. or whatever other role-playing game you're playing, here is what I believe makes a good session of a TTRPG. One of the first things you must consider is time. Time. How long are people going to be at your table? How long of a session have you prepared? Some of us like to believe you could just stand there forever, maybe dedicating an entire week or weekend where you rent out an Airbnb cabin. You're doing nothing but playing that entire time. Others live in a more realistic world where maybe you only meet up once a month. And when you do meet up, you only have a couple of hours to spare. So the biggest thing to keep in mind this really depends on you and your group and your wants. So talk about it. Talk about it. But if you're doing virtual sessions, two hours. Why two hours? Trust me, two hours. If you're meeting on Zoom or Discord or whatever you're doing, you can have a much more efficient session than if you're in person. So for me, two hours is tight. Two hours. In person, you're looking more at three hours. Why? Well, you really have to reward players for taking the time to drive to this location where you're playing. You have to leave time for chit-chat small talk. How you been? How are the kids? Good. How are yours? All right. Yeah. Hey, good job on that promotion. What? I didn't get promoted. I got fired. What? You got fired? Yeah, you didn't hear? No. Yeah. Ends up the boss allergic to peanuts. <laughs> My bad. And speaking of peanuts, you also have to leave time for snacks. Again, your goal is to reward your players for showing up, and snacks does help with that. You don't need snacks or small talk in a virtual environment, but you do when it comes to in-person. Again, totally depends on your group. But here is the main golden rule. You always, always want your players wanting more. It is way better to leave the session with them saying, more please, rather than exhausting them. You never want to overstay the game's welcome. Because again, you want people to come back for more and more. That's my very generic advice about time. Keep them wanting more. This is true also in life. But let's get to a specific checklist. There's two methods to consider. The first method I call the point and click method. Point and click. The point and click method named after those adventure games that perhaps if you're like me, you've learned to love. I'm talking King's Quest, Space Quest, So You Want to Be a Hero, Leisure Suit Larry, I'm not judging, Secret of Monkey Island, yes please. All of these games have a point and click methodology. You have your mouse and you left click or you right click. What does the right click do on your mouse? It changes the icon of your cursor. Instead of just having an arrow, you could have a boot, or an eyeball, or a sword, or a head, or a backpack. What do all those mean? 
We'll get to it. This point and click methodology is an evolution of the parser based original adventure games. And if I'm going to be honest, I miss those parser based games because they were truly open ended where you could just type in anything you wanted to pick up key, put gem in mouth, youth key on door. And that's why we like our tabletop role playing games is because they're so open ended. You can do almost anything. Your imagination is really your only limitation. But let's go through the different icons. First, we have the move icon, the arrow icon or the boot or some little dude moving. This means your guy can walk all over the place. You want this in every single one of your role play sessions. What do I mean by this? Your players need an opportunity to explore. Do not imprison them in one location. Even if they're in one building, let your players explore room by room by room. Even in a room, let them walk around that room. Freedom, yo. Next is the hand icon, the grab icon, where you can touch or take something. Yes, you should have something in every session that your players can interact with with their dirty little mittens. What can they loot? What can they take? What is the reward? As I previously mentioned, we also have the eyeball icon. You want plenty of things that they can examine, that they can look at. This is your opportunity as the dungeon master to really pontificate on the beautiful things in their environment. Again, I'm a huge advocate of the theater of the mind. So if you don't have pictures, you're gonna have to use your words to explain what they're seeing. So imagine that you're in King's Quest and you see a snake on the road. So you click on it with the eye icon. And then that annoying owl Cedric says, Graham, careful, that's a poisonous snake. Graham, watch out, a poisonous snake. Dumbass, don't you know the difference between poisonous and venomous? That's a venomous snake, I think is what you mean. I'm not about to eat that snake. Anyways, I digress, getting into the weeds, but you need to have examine, take, move, but you also need that closed fist. Sometimes it's depicted as a sword. You want some type of violent encounter potential. You don't have to have a violent encounter in every session, but you want that potential in every session. Cause this kind of also goes with the move icon. Do you fight this thing or do you simply avoid it? Give them that option or potential of a violent encounter. And this leads nicely into the talking head. Yes, you need NPCs, someone you can talk with or barter. I'll buy that, but for two coin, not the 10 coin you're offering. Where is this woman? I need to know, I have to find her. Leave me alone, sir. Give them options. And this is also your opportunity to role play and for them to role play and act. But here's the most complicated one of them all. This is the inventory. Yes, your players have a part of their character sheet where they keep track of all the things that they own. Is it a magic artifact? Is it a special piece of equipment? Give them an opportunity to think about how they're going to use the tools. And that is represented with your inventory backpack icon. This bespeaks to the puzzle lovers, rewarding your players for thinking smarter instead of working harder. So yes, how can you use your inventory and the tools around you to get further in the game. And speaking of character sheets, that brings me to the second method, as I call it, the character sheet method. Character Take sheet. a look at any character sheet. Here's a Mothership one. I'm kind of partial. You should buy Mothership and all of its shit today at TuesdayNightGames.com. But look at all the different things you have on this character sheet. You have your different stats. You have saves. You have your body save, your mind save, you have stress, you have health, you have the inventory, which we were just talking about, you have money, coin, but then oh my goodness, look at how you can progress and level up and get all these new skills. There's so much here on this character sheet, including class differences. Yes, you have to choose a class. There is a huge difference between a rogue and a cleric. Give the opportunity for a wizard to shine, versus your fighter or your warrior. So think of this as that checklist. In a good session, there is an opportunity to gain or lose health. Was there an opportunity to lose stress, sanity, 
or hope for the upcoming Father Fall game that I'm making. Then you have stats. Make sure that they're doing some stat checks. Saves. Things have to be happening to them. Give them an opportunity to use their skills for whatever situation they may apply. And then they have their inventory. What do they have in their tool bag to help them solve these puzzles and move forward? You also have people that love to level up. So make sure they have that opportunity to gain XP and progress. And then last but not least, the class. And the class has a lot to do with the skills. And there you have it, two very strong methods, two checklists. Do you do the character sheet method or do you do the point and click method? Both of these have the same goal and that is fun. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think. Buy all of our shit today. Links below, subscribe or die, and I'll see you next time. Bye.